handle it while I continue handling mine. What would you say you do here? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> I am the worst. Uh, I apparently, our two guests, I, I sent them both the wrong um, uh, links. So there we go. Uh, Tech Savvy, the Diojo podcast. So we actually made a video to intro this topic. So I'm going to actually, sorry, apologies, re rewrite, edit. Um, we're going to bring in our first guest, a local uh, senior project manager restorer that reached out. Let's see. Here we are. Good morning, Joyce. Good morning. How are you doing, John? Good. I see you're enjoying the lovely sunny day here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, everybody thinks it always rains, and that's not the truth, right? <laughs> well, like, well, it could change this afternoon, but right now it's sunny and beautiful. It could change during this interview, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So you and I had the, the pleasure of meeting together for coffee. Uh, we have a mutual friend, Luke Drager from Arams Co., um, that uh, co-authored. Oh, I don't have it right. It's right here. The Be Intentional. I have it. Hey! Yep. <laughs> yeah, okay. I've got copies too. So um, you were so kind to shout out the estimating book. Uh, you said that, uh, you know, it was subpar and it really didn't help you, but you thought it could maybe help some of your coworkers. <laughs> Absolutely subpar. No information yeah. for me in there. Yes. Yeah. Just dribble, dribble, dribble. Um, I'm issuing you a full refund, and uh, you know, thankfully, you didn't spend that much for it, anyways. But uh, so, tell us a little bit. You are a estimator. Um, you grew up in property restoration. You were born in property restoration. You went to high school thinking you were going to be in property restoration. Um, you know, that was Absolutely. your dream. Yeah, yeah. So, how did you get into estimating? Absolutely. And Sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, how did you get into into this world? So, ironically enough, I lived in a small that had a surf pro just a few minutes away. And I relocate to them from the current job, but like my former experience, all um, customer service and administrative. And that's yeah. what they were looking yeah. for was being, you know, a job at administrative. Um, getting files all together and sending them off to the wow. insurance company. So with my customer service background, that was really handy. And then I, it kind of grew, you know, it was a small franchise. So it was all hands on deck. You just fit in and did what you could do. So as I saw openings, I just started working with them. We had a, a very experienced uh, estimator and independent adjuster that worked with us who started showing me how to use Xactimate. And it was just trial and error from there. Yeah. 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 Like most, thankfully, I think I talk about in the book, I had a good uh, mentor, but a lot of it I think was copy and paste and, and then you get rejected and your teeth kicked in and you learn what not to write. Right. So. Um, Absolutely. It was a, uh, I think the content estimate was the hardest to learn at first, yeah. what could be used and what couldn't be used and thinking outside the box and when to use labor lines. And, um, and then when adjusters tell you, Oh, we don't want to pay for, um, uh, furniture pads, you yeah. know, because that's cost of job. And I'm like, no, no, you can pay for that or you can pay for washing of it, you know, your mm -hmm. choice. Yep. So, yeah, contents in particular, I remember I went to a large restore and the, the prior estimator had always been just using labor, time, and materials. And so, exactly like you're talking about, I taught myself, I started reading all the line items and we, we increased our contents, you know, significantly just by utilizing the program, you know, so. Absolutely. Can... That's where we had done a lot of it, uh, where I started out was using you know, the labor lines and uh, time and materials. But then as we, um, again, just like you picking up other estimates, you know, talking to my other project manager saying, hey, what's what's the estimate you used previously? Um, and then we also had a uh, production manager that came in that was had solely focused on the fire side. And she was very knowledgeable with content estimates and cleaning. And yeah. so I was able to learn a lot from her as well. And uh, the other one is the high density boxes. Yeah. So they are, those are great for yeah. getting good profit margin on them. 
Well, and especially if it's a fire, clean, mm -hmm. pack the box, unpack the box, new yep. box, you know, all those kinds of things. So, well, honestly, one of the things when we sat down that you, you said that stuck out to me, your proof of concept that, um, you know, this is a customer service industry, right? The skill sets mm -hmm. you can learn. Um, and you talked about how you took a course on interpersonal uh, relationships at your prior um, company and how that's helped you throughout. Um, and I know prior that experience probably is maybe one of the most significant until the emergence of this, right? And then this changed your life for forever. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm I'm still uh, still reading my way through it, but we've uh, we've had some we've had some pretty busy weeks because half of our oh, team's yeah. down in Texas, but. Absolutely. In my um, in my early twenties, I was a, a a supervisor for a call center, and uh, as I was explaining to you, the first team that I worked on was mainly people my age, and my communication style is very blunt, very black and white. Yeah. And we were able to be successful, so they moved me to another team, the bottom team on the whole floor, um, yeah. and again elevate them quickly to the number one team. And my previous number one team was the number two, so. What I was working with them was sticking with them, so they were still able to perform even though I wasn't there. So then I was quickly moved again to the bottom team again to help move them. And, you know, three weeks a month in, I was not um, doing very well. Yeah. You know, the team didn't perform again, and I, I couldn't wrap my head around it, being 24, 25, not really having any life experience. Yeah. And yeah. What my operations manager had explained to me was that I was offending my team. And when I started looking at the, he pointed out to me the dynamics of the new team were older people that maybe didn't appreciate my communication style. Yeah. Um, and he said that I was offending them. Yeah. So he sent me to an interpersonal communication course where I learned my communication style, but then also other communication styles. Yeah. And what I learned and what stuck out the most and has been hugely advantageous uh, in my professional life and personal is that I can say anything to anyone. It's just in my approach. Yeah. So yeah. being able to speak to them where they're at, gauge what their communication style is um, and speak to them that way. Yeah. And that's, that's been a huge um, cornerstone for me. Well, I know, um, let's see, Larry Wilberton and Eric Sprague, their uh, uh, blue collar nation podcast, they're big believers in the disc profile um, I reached out to Jeremy Watkin, who was on, and he does customer service, trains customer service centers. He's a big believer in strength finders. And I just read a book by Zoe Roth. Uh, it's called People Stuff. And she's got a, I remember there's the elder, the warrior, there's different dynamics, but it is very, all those threads are kind of trying to understand where somebody else is coming from and, and achieve success by working with them rather than against them, right? So. Absolutely. And there's a lot of things that come natural to people. And if you build on those strengths, you know, yeah. acknowledging where they are, building on their strengths and making sure they're in the right fit for their position, yeah. um, because you can only force a, you know, a square block into a round hole so much. Yeah. Um, but when you find them a good fit and you're communicating with them in the right place, they can yeah. be successful. And when they're successful, you're successful. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you, Joyce. I know you're you're out. Uh, you're running and gunning, uh, making things happen here in the Northwest. So, looking forward Absolutely. to Absolutely. We got we got a large loss that came in on Saturday. It's a uh, seventy-two thousand square feet. So I've been on this pretty much all week. So. Oh, yeah. Real well. Yeah. Well, thank you for t carving out some time for us again. Thank you for shouting out the books and uh, looking forward to many more conversations to come. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Have a great day. All right. Thank you, Joyce. Oh, I cut her off. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, uh, like I said, in the Northwest, uh, great resources. Um, and uh, so I did make, without further ado, I know we're running a little bit behind. I made a short um, video intro. So I'm going to play that instead of doing it live. Here we go. This week. This Thursday, we have a treat for you. We are talking mergers and acquisitions. Mergers, mergers and, and acquisitions. acquisitions. Like Thanos. <laughs> pulling in all of the gems from our industry and adding them to his fist of fury. Let's put a smile on my face. 
will um, what will the future of the industry be? We are talking with the recently acquired Mark Springer Day Spring Restoration. Hello, I'm Mark Springer with Day Spring Restoration. You may remember me as the guy who flooded my home. Well, I'm at it again. We'll, we'll be talking about that process, what it looks like for a restoration owner, a team to, um, even if you don't want to sell. <laughs> looks like to get your finances in order so that you're sell a bull and then uh, some of what does this tell us about our industry what can restorers do that want to remain independent how about new you crazy Dutch bastard how do you get some of the values the positives of consolidation and apply that to your business so Join us Thursday, the Diojo podcast, talking mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions. There it is. Boom. <laughs> We're like a, a mediocre production company around here. So talk about things that aren't mediocre. We are sponsored today by iRestore Restoration Software. Uh, we've got a little ditty we'll do in the middle and then um, something really fun from uh, our friends at GMS and Born to Repair. But without further ado, let's bring in the man, the myth, the legend, Mark Springer. Is that uh, is Mark your full name or is that short for Marcus Aurelius Springer? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, just the plain old Mark, the just plain, plain old vanilla. Mark. The plan, yeah, here. John. How you? So I didn't. Um, the the video. Were you having a little bit of choppiness on that? Um, I didn't notice it on my end. The intro video. Yeah, it it, it was uh, chopping up on my end. So I I'd, I'd love to see that at some point because there was like a couple seconds where it worked and then a bunch where it didn't. So oh. anyway, uh, tech. I gotta love technology, right? Oh man. It's great when it works. <laughs> oh yeah. No. And I, uh, your uh, intro video at the very beginning, like your intro is, man, that's awesome. <laughs> I need to, I need to like hire you to make us an intro video for when we do our um, RIA industry briefings. Well, so the, the, the intern, the intentional restore those graphics and the way that comes and everything that was actually Ed Cross. He created the original, intro video for the intentional restore put it really? and everything so uh this is season two right i think next uh got it next episode will be our year anniversary so ed's pretty dang talented too i just uh it's yeah, yeah. it, it, 495 dollars an hour for the uh <laughs> restoration lawyer <laughs> yeah yeah well and he's got a lot better things to do than uh, <laughs> you know build up our vanity so um, so that, uh, yeah, that, uh, I have, I've got so many questions. I, um, I, I sent you that article that I put together trying to kind of wrap my head around it. It's, it's the magnum opus. That thing was, uh, that was a monstrosity, man. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to make full disclosure. Uh, and that's, I, I had to, I tried to make a conclusion for the article and I don't have one. So full disclosure, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is the just the natural progression for an industry, if it's a good mm. thing or a bad thing. Um, right. Obviously, you've made a decision, right? You've you've mm. uh, gone the route. You've been absorbed by Thanos. You're you're in the Infinity Stone uh, glove. I think it's so dramatic. <laughs> so, um, but uh, but yeah. So that's uh, I, I just full disclosure. I, I honestly don't have a take on it. I have some sincere questions. No. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your perspective, both as a restorer, obviously mm -hmm. in the mix. And then, um, you know, as that relates to your efforts on the, the broader scale of the, uh, you know, restoration industry association and just trying to make it leave a legacy. I know is something that you talk about a lot. So leave it better than we found it. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. How can we, uh, how can we leave this industry better than we found it? And I, you know, and some of that probably gets to, you know, I think the people who have legacy in this industry or, you know, some of the people that have went before us to get it where we are today. So yeah. when I, those people, I think of legacy, I think for us now, there's just some real challenges that we have in this industry that, 
you know, we as the the kind of people here in this place and time have to address. And there's some yeah. big challenges, you know. And so it's good to be able to to make some progress on those. But a lot of a lot of people are working to make that happen. So the last time we spoke, you were in the heart of uh, of making the deal final. Then is that correct? Yeah, I probably, I probably wasn't talking about it. I was. I, I think I was like you know, acting really important, like, oh, I'm really busy, John, right now, you know, and you and they were like, yeah, everybody's busy, you know, oh, I'm sure you're the only guy who's busy out there right now, you know, but that was a particularly busy time, because, yeah, we were in the middle of our transaction, and yeah, and, uh, that's a, you know, until you've been through those, um, it's hard to describe what it's like, how much work it is, yeah. um, what actually goes into the successful execution of a deal. Um, you know, I've been on the other side of some deals over the years. We've acquired uh, yeah. a, a handful of, of companies, but this was kind of a whole different level, right? I mean, yeah. as far as due diligence goes and all the mechanics to actually get a, a transaction completed. It was last year was crazy. I mean, cause we not only have that going on, you know, we're leading yeah. our company through a pandemic, which was, you know, unprecedented, of course, RIA through a pandemic, which had all, all sort of, you know, unprecedented elements in that as well. So yeah, yeah. it was crazy. Uh, 2020, what a year for the ages. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think maybe, maybe that's a great place to start. Um, I think a lot of people think, think they know their numbers, right? And mm -hmm. uh, you and I had a conversation offline about some of these items too. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does that look like? Maybe uh, if we rewind the tape a little bit to as Day Spring Restoration, you've done some acquisitions. That's very mm -hmm. common in our industry. You know, yeah. Belfour perhaps has been the best at it, right? Um, just yeah, for sure. massive growth through acquisitions. Yeah. Um, so what does that conversation look like? The everyday restorers listening to this and thinking, oh, I know my numbers. People would be glad to have me on their team. I'll just take them through the roof. What, is, what does that look like to really know your numbers and you as somebody potentially acquiring somebody in your region or locally, um, what does that, that look like and how can a, a restorer do a better job of that? Hmm. So I think I would maybe even step back one more step from there to, to think about and maybe just a, a brief discussion on objectives, business objectives, right? Because everyone has to have objectives for their organization. Um, I, I remember someone, I don't even think it was someone in this industry, but someone challenged me many years ago about exit strategy. What is your exit strategy? You have to start planning today even in, in the infancy of your company for its exit. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of different ways exits happen, right? Um, some exits happen unintentionally. Uh, someone yeah. has a life event that happens um, or their business just loses focus. They grow bored with the industry and the yeah. exit essentially is the demise of the organization, right? That's the worst right. kind yeah. of exit. Yeah, it, uh, you know, every year um, it's interesting when my dad started Day Spring Restoration back in 1989, uh, I believe, and and I could be wrong, it could be someone uh, who, who challenges me on this, but I believe that there is not a single restoration, property restoration company in the state of Montana who still is in business oh. that was uh, at the time in business at the time he founded the company in 1989 there was uh, another great company in montana buffalo restoration i think they came just a little after my dad started i think they started in like 1991. um but what's interesting about this industry is we've seen you know the, the franchise companies change hands numerous times yep uh they, they've changed ownership has changed in those over and over and over again um, there has been uh, uh, the companies that were kind of the bigger companies at the time that my dad started. Uh, they've they've come and gone, and and unfortunately, in almost all those cases, the exit has been less than ideal. So it's been cases where either they closed their doors and there was nothing. I mean, it was an asset sale. They sold some equipment. In some cases, they called us up and said. Hey, do you want to buy our assets uh, now that we're closing our doors? Or they had a very mediocre transaction or exit where 
you know, maybe the business is sold to what would be the next level, kind of an employee purchase where it's sold to the, the employees in the organization. Now, sometimes that can work, but it has to be very well thought through. There has to be a very defined strategy around uh, a transition to employees in the organization. Some yeah. people will try things called ESOPs. That's an employee-owned stock program. Um, or there's the other way, which is a very well-defined exit um, that may come in the form of an outside investor or a strategic acquisition, um, which would be something you mentioned, Belfour, and you're absolutely right. I think Belfour did the best job of uh, growing their organization through uh, acquisitions. Uh, the CFO at Belfour, who's no longer with us anymore, uh, Joe Shalino. Joe had an incredible vision for how they would expand Belfour, and he really did the hard work behind the scenes there in their acquisitions across the United States and even around the world. So they were one of the first for sure uh, to take that approach, and uh, a lot has changed since that time um, that, that has, has impacted the industry. But I think the most important thing, John, that everyone has to know, even before the numbers, is what what would a exit look like for yeah. me? What do I want to do? Where do I want to get this? What are the goals and vision that I have for the company? And that may change over time. Certainly it did for me. Uh, over time, our strategy evolved. And I think we've talked in the past about some of the tools we use for that uh, strategy. One, a major one was scaling up uh, the one-page strategic plan. Uh, that Vern Harnish espouses in the scaling up uh, kind of methodology was a, a really important one. Um, quick little plug on that. Vern Harnish yeah. will be the 75th keynote uh, presenter for RIA's convention in July or June, end of June, June 28th to 30th. So anyone who's interested in learning more about that, they should sign up for RIA's 75th convention in Orlando. There they can uh, see and meet Vern Harnish face to face there. Uh, but but that's really uh, key is defining what does the exit, what exit do I want to work toward? I think anyone that would think, I know you were giving me a hard time about being a sellout. Um, and, you know, that certainly probably was well deserved. But Just like everyone, yeah, yeah. So everyone has to think about that at some point, though. What is What does the exit look like? Because without a plan for an exit, I think there's, you know, a lot of floundering uh that that can happen there so so that's where i would start does that, does that make make sense yeah well, that was the well, first step i think would you talk about on the lines of um eric sprague and larry wilberton from blue collar nation podcast were on mm -hmm. and they might have actually said this on josh brolin's uh blue is the new white but um saying they were taught early on uh you know build your business as though you were going to sell it Right. Yeah. Even if you don't plan to, you know, uh, come with that mentality. But that's I, I think, yeah, you're 100 percent right is having a vision and values. You know, do your vision and values. Yeah. Are they defined or the objectives? So that makes a lot and of it, sense. And, and I think right now it's more important than ever to be able to really be thinking about and defining what are my goals? What are the goals yeah. that I have for my family? For yeah. me personally, um, uh, for the team that we've built, what what is important for me within the structure yeah. of how our organization operates. Yeah. Geographic regions of the country can define uh, the strategy that someone might employ. I mean, if you were in a large metro area, that could define some of the exit yeah. uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that's different than uh, someone who operates in, you know, kind of a, a second or third tier population area where, where it's smaller communities, more rural, yeah. like, for example, my company's in a more rural state here in Montana. So th those will also define that. But I think more than ever, a restoration company has to be grappling with these things right now because consolidation and, uh, you know, acquisition and really seeing this maturation in our industry is totally evident at this point and, yeah. and a lot of restorers know that they're you know they get calls every single week uh from someone who's either looking to acquire companies whether they be you know strategic acquisitions we can talk more about the difference between a strategic or just purely a financial investor but um you know their phones are ringing all the time and yeah. this consolidation trend is is accelerating right now um, you know, it's, it's really at a fever pitch right now. And so yeah. more than ever, it's important that restorers understand these concepts because they are going to 
uh, really be thrust into this and have to make a decision one way or the other uh, really quickly. Well, I want to be mindful too. This is a whole new, a whole new world. Um, the consolidation, let's, you know, for, for terms we're using, making sure that we're being clear about what they mean. Can you help kind of dis- define consolidation and what it means, um, you know, for, for our industry, what you see, uh, how you see that impacting the industry? Yeah. So uh, right now, I don't think any, but there's two different levels of what we would kind of call the fragmentation of our industry. Okay. There's a fragmentation in the, from the sense of the brands. So the brands are very uh, diverse right now. And you think I'm going to use an example. I talked with another person who's an executive level uh, in this industry in a very large, one of the very large national, actually global brands uh, in the restoration world. And he actually came from an entirely different industry. He came from the food industry. You think back in the food industry, maybe 30 or 40 years, you know, there was a lot of, uh, the food brand, especially amongst maybe the kind of the quick, the drive in the almost maybe not fast food, but fast foodish, um, world where in any city or any community, there was a lot of brands out there. Yeah. Very fragmented there. Consolidation came as all of these national and even global brands uh, really started to expand their footprint. And, you know, I think of when I was young, you know, I was in high school, for example, let's talk about Taco Bell. You know, there's one Taco Bell in Missoula, Montana, the town I grew up in. Now yeah. there's Taco Bells all over the place. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, there was taco stands all, you know, there, there was a, there were probably half a dozen different, you know, kind of taco standish sort of, you know, we had these these brands, like I think Taco John's, for example, was a big one. I don't even know if there's any more Taco John's or not. There may be, but I don't, I don't think there's any of those left. So what happened in the in the food industry, this consolidation happened where there was more and more investment. The brands that really had a good strategy or a good uh, plan for execution, they expanded. You saw more and more of these developing. And then the, the smaller brands either got acquired uh, by by those or else they just couldn't compete anymore. And yeah. so in the restoration space, that's where we're at right now. We have so many independents right now uh, that are out in every single community. There's restoration brands at, at the local level that only exist in that area of the yeah. country. We see the brands uh, consolidating now as these major companies, you think of, you know, ServPro had a major investment from BlackRock, uh, Service Master from Rourke. Now they have major investment there as they kind of really honed in their strategy for their brand. Uh, Belfort had a major investment from American Securities, yeah. uh, First Service and, and First Onsite. No, so that one's a whole bunch of different brands that are all unifying right now um, with some of the big acquisitions that they've had there. You think of in interstate restoration, one one element of first on site that now is going to be doing business is first on site. Uh, you know, they acquired Rollin companies, they acquired Perfection, they acquired a whole bunch of different companies. You know, made really pretty major restoration companies that now are going to become part of. First, it was the interstate brand. Now it's going to be the first on site brand. So that that consolidation is just all these brands kind of defining their national strategies and then working across the country. The second level of fragmentation is one we probably talk more about, you know, at RIA. That's some of the kind of maybe micro trends within the industry uh, that we've been addressing, some of these challenges to the industry with things like uh, third-party consultants, the increase in advent of of TPAs, third-party administrators, uh, some of the trends within the pricing platforms, regulatory uh, and uh, national trends that may affect us legislatively. Uh, for example, you know, we had the changes with AOB law in Florida, which then, uh, you know, and there, there's all, that's a big issue there, but now, you know, we just, an issue we just jumped into just this week um, is the uh, similar, there's a, a legislation in Idaho right now around assignment of benefit language. And really, I think from the carrier's perspective, they're trying to kind of have this broad spectrum of, uh, really AOB changes that 
you know, ultimately probably under undermine a restorer's rights and their ability to contract in some of these things, you know, that that fragmentation we feel is, is a different one. So I think it's important to define these two different types of fragmentation. But when we're talking about fragmentation in the context of M&A mergers and acquisitions, it really just means all these divergent brands that we have across the country really becoming more and more consolidated and really from, you know, thousands of restoration brands, you know, it's going to go from there down to hundreds and then maybe ultimately dozens uh, yeah. that are actually doing business in the industry. Well, do you see, um, and that's kind of, it seems in our country and then in businesses, you have the mega companies and you have right. the mom and pop companies. So really those companies that are most at risk is what we might call the middle class, right? Like, uh, yeah. You have a couple, I mean, Dayspring would be an example, right? You have a couple right. of locations. You're not huge. You're definitely not small. Um, so those are going to be the biggest. And what I would assume the conversation with Trinity Hunt is, this is, and they've said, they said that in the press release, so we're not assuming, set up mm -hmm. kind of a regional hub and they want to grow out from there, right? Um, That's right? And they obviously, you know, we got Belfort and Surpro on the East Coast, um, ATI interstate spend a lot more West or blue sky has been part of the West yep. coast. Um, so there's the race to get it all right. Um, mm -hmm. so what do you, how does that, um, if, if, if companies want to remain independent, and I think that was something that stuck out to me, consolidation, the benefits of consolidation are, and I related that in the article, one of my favorite breweries, 10 barrel got purchased by Anheuser-Busch, right? Uh, Budweiser. And so that was a big to do, especially in Oregon, because now an independent company got bought by one of the bigs and then up here, Elysian got bought by Coors. Um, but uh, one of the things those owners talked about, they now have access to hops at like fraction of the cost of what they yeah. used to pay for it. Right. So um, if, if, if you wanted to remain independent, you're going to have to find some way to collaborate. Right. I mean, there's going to have to be whether that's RIA or I know Dan Casera with um, Core, you know, there's restoration affiliates. In some way, you have to give up independence to remain independent. Yeah. Would, would that be on par with some of what you talk about for fragmentation with RIA? Yeah, I think you know it's back. Let's go back to the food analogy again. Yeah, you know yeah. there still are mom and pop, yeah, uh, food operators. Right. It's not that they're all going away. It's just that their strategy now has to be laser yeah. focused. Yeah. They have to have a niche that they are able to serve in an in a really exceptional way. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of I think if we're realistic, there's a lot of mediocre restoration companies right now. Yeah. And they don't have a very defined niche or a very defined strategy. Those ones are going to be very, very hard uh, to survive through this consolidation phase that we have. And the consolidation phase will probably last a decade. You know, we're, we're probably right here in the first couple innings of the consolidation right now. Um, and more of that's going to happen. Um, but as we move forward, if you don't have a way as an independent restoration company uh, to be truly exceptional, um, it, it's going to be super, super challenging. And I think the ones yeah. that don't have a very either that either don't become a part of the consolidation or have a very defined strategy, they're just going to uh, die by a thousand cuts. Yeah, uh, because there's no question those ones we already talked about, you know, Belfour, Blue Sky, Interstate First On Site, Service Master Surfer, all of these uh brands have super smart people at the yeah. helm right now yeah. they have very well defined strategy they have very excellent technology you know yeah. sometimes people i think they like to pick on the big companies and they sure. you know i hear guys you know that are like oh they'll they'll have comments about you know these guys really don't know what they're doing or you know they just they're just really big or you know they have all these kind of kind of disparaging comments and i'm like man I don't think you really understand what those companies are doing from an execution yeah. standpoint. There are some super, super smart people yeah. there. And, you know, even in my situation now, you know, one of the upsides of the consolidation in, in our case with Trinity Hunt, you know, we're on a much earlier phase than like a Interstate or Blue Sky or one of those. Those went through the same phases. Those organizations went through the same phases that we're in now. Uh, Blue Sky, particularly if you think about Blue Sky, 
you know, they start in Colorado. They had initial investment uh, from private equity in uh, Florida, private equity company in Florida. And then through that investment phase, then they, they now have a different private equity, but larger uh, private equity partner that's able to kind of take them to the next level of their business goals. And so, so Dane Spring and Trinity Hunt, we're just in an earlier phase of that right now yeah. um, in that we're, we're building a, you know, a completely different niche. Uh, we have a different area of the market that we believe we can uh, uniquely address that, that there's some unique market differentiators that we can build in, in a national restoration company, a national presence for a company through, through this kind of regional approach and Day Springs, the Northwest regional approach for that. So, um, yeah, so we'll be we're working on that. We're, we're, you know, like all these groups, we're pursuing uh, companies all over the country right now to be able to do that. It's just super competitive right now. There's tons and yeah. tons of interest in what's happening. And it, it makes it really a good time for a restore. If they are going, if they are at a point in their, uh, business trajectory that it makes sense to consider that it's a really good time right now because yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a seller's market. There's a lot of interest. Yeah, um, I'm going to take a quick break and pay some bills. Um, so if you got to do that, man, hold tight. <laughs> Here's uh, uh, here we go. Do you have trouble sleeping at night? Please go away. Let me sleep for the love of God. Are you troubled? You feel alone and counting sheep just won't do it. <laughs> when you think about counting lost productivity, I'm scared to close my eyes. <laughs> inefficiencies or the inability to power your equipment. I'm scared to open them. We understand your concerns, and today, the Diojo Podcast brings the solo combined solution. This is a master class in how you cross-promote. How you prop up your brethren and your sistren. Uh, and the great things that they're doing to help bring peace of mind, whether you need to repair equipment or power it. Again, masterclass, uh, Elon Posmanic, Born to Repair. Uh, best way to find him, Instagram or Facebook, at Born to T-O Repair. And of course, Jarrett Steer, GMS Distribution Boxes, the best in the industry. He's the best. Love it. So, Elon repairs equipment, uh, Jarrett powers it. Uh, Elon was recently on Jarrett's GMS podcast. Check both those dudes out. It's fantastic. And this great tip of the week from our friend Elon, Born to Repair. Many times I'm asked to repair a DHU that supposedly won't run like this one, but there's actually nothing wrong with it. So I'm going to show you how to make sure that everything is okay with your DHU before you send it to the repair shop. First, make sure that the evaporator freezes. Then add water into the drip tray. And make sure the water flows down the hose into the pump. Check if it purges by itself and also by pressing the purge button. Then just let it run and wait for it to defrost. You can save a lot of money if you test your equipment before you send it to the shop. And while you're at it, clean your filter too before you send it to the next job. Do you feel like you live in a world where everyone and everything is hitting you all at the same time with their urgent demands? In a word? Chaos. <laughs> what does an intentional restorer do to keep themselves organized and their upward mobility on the tracks? <laughs> Friends, it's time to calm the chaos. Get, Get your, your team, team organized, organized and focus where it matters, growing your business. I restore IO. The restoration company management software from iRestore, powering your vision, values, and leadership. 
requests a demo. Here's the features. We got job management, relationship management, AKA CRM, equipment management, vehicle management, human resources, and scheduling. Request a demo. All you gotta do is click, no obligation. Check it out. You follow all instructions and you? Save it and forget it. I restore. Don't just take our word for it or I restore's word for it. Here's a customer review. As a small business owner in a unique industry, I am glad we chose I restore for our go-to project management system. Their team has been great with understanding our needs and providing prompt customer service. I love having direct contacts when I need them and the same support staff to work with. Being able to ask for little changes that allow our processes to work within the system has been great instead of having to adapt to a system's processes. I restore. Boom. Okay, we're back with the Mark Springer. Uh, Day Spring Restoration, president of uh, Restoration Industry Association. So uh, Trinity Hunt, they own the Kansas City Chiefs, right? Well, or, they or Hunt does. the Hunt family does. Um, yeah, so the Hunt family is the seed investment in Trinity Hunt for each of their uh, funds. So they, they're, I think, on their fifth fund right now. So yeah. they make the initial kind of seed uh, investment. And then there's all sorts of other uh, equity investors that come into these individual funds. And and, yeah. uh, and that's how kind of the, the private equity funds work. You got a high net worth individual. Typically they set aside some money and then the goal is to make that money, make more money, right? Novel, novel concept. <laughs> yeah. And there's, and there's a whole different range of them, right? I mean, there's, uh, I think like 10,000 private equity companies in the country. A lot of them have different, focuses and how they uh, want to invest their their money. There's all different sizes. I mean, you've got ones that are massive uh, funds, massive private equity funds with, you know, billions and billions under management. BlackRock, the investor in Surf Pro certainly is a very large private equity fund. Um, and then you go, you know, all the way down to some private equity funds have, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars and that are on the small side, then everything in between. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I guess the uh, so you have the there there's some concern, some trepidation, right, um, as to private equity. We understand consolidation. We understand combining forces. Um, I tried to do that in the article. Talk about there's some of the the huge deals, right? The Belfors, the the Serb Pros, um, and then there's some package deals, some teaming up deals. You know, Blue Sky Harbor. That's an internal. Um, kind of teaming up. Um, so there, there's some concern, a history with private equity that maybe they, they get in. Um, I know this was brought up during, you know, not to get political, but I guess it's not political. Maybe it is. We are. We're in a political environment. But like with Min Romney was running for president, right? His mm -hmm. background with Bain and, and then the whether the picture's accurate or not, right? People are casting like they just grab this business, they strip it, you know, basically mine it, leave it in the dust and say, you know, okay, we, we've done our, our business. Um, I thought it was interesting in the article about Trinity Hunt. Uh, and, and also, I think it's, you said BlackRock, I think it's Blackstone, isn't it? Am I yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, it is Blackstone. I, I'm not trying to correct you, just maybe in case. No, I, you can correct me all day long, John, no problem. Um, but the, uh, you know, the, both of them had said in their statements that it was a longer term investment. They're in it for the long haul. You know, obviously people can say whatever they want. But um, was, is that, do you see that? Was that a concern of yours? Was that part of the conversation um, yeah. when you were making your deal? Yeah. Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's, I mean, it's really everything. I mean, it's obviously yeah. a topic that's near and dear to you because you just put out the, uh, the book, the, the book on culture, um, but culture is everything, right. And yeah. finding a, a good fit uh, with a, a investor, if you're going to go that route is, is really critical because there's all the horror stories out there. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that investments manage, right. You've got, you know, things from hedge funds, which are a totally different, you know, uh, investment uh, mechanism there to, to private equity. And, 
you know, in, in private equity, there's really a kind of a couple different areas there that someone would look at. Uh, one is private equity that's already invested in this space. And they always use that word space. That's how they kind of just the word they use for, to describe an industry as a space. So when you hear that, that's what uh, we're talking about. So in this space, you've got the ones, the American Securities, you partner with uh, ATI, the, of course, American Securities with Belfort, but ATI has a, a private equity investment. Uh, ones like Cotton Restoration has some capital now. So some of those are already in the restoration industry right, and right. they they believe in the company that they have. And they want to grow that company. And there's a couple ways they grow those companies. One is organically through uh, the, the private equity word they use is de novo expansion. So that de novo expansion is basically taking a company that already has an established footprint and helping them organically grow into other territories or services, right? So that's one strategy they use. Um, another uh, strategy is through acquisition, and that's kind of the easier, quicker way to do that. Um, and some of the private equity companies right now that are out there in this space are, are essentially bundling, right? So what they're doing is they're they're using a strategy called arbitrage, where they put together a, a, a number of different companies uh, to be able to get the EBITDA to a point that it attracts as a consolidated company uh, to attract a different level of investment at a higher multiple. So if they can buy companies at a multiple that is, you know, uh, a smaller size company, and then being part of the whole, they grow to a, a, a bigger multiple. That arbitrage is is attractive to some private equity companies, and they're they're very. Um, motivated just by that strategy primarily it's not so much about building a brand as more or less bundling or consolidating ebitda um, and there are some of those that are out there right now um, you know those particular approaches were not um, all that interesting to me they were kind of concerning to me because the vision and the strategy isn't as defined it's a quicker play mostly for people at the end of their career that maybe want to get out and and have some upside yeah. over a short period of time um, you know, then there is the other private equity companies, and this is what Trinity Hunt was with us, that has a thesis around restoration. So they look at an industry and they say, we see in this industry fragmentation. We believe there's an opportunity for another brand that has another maybe specific or unique niche and focus. We can grow this company within that niche and uh, build a, with investment, build a, another world-class company. That's yeah. what was attractive to us uh, with Trinity Hunt. They have this thesis around this industry and uh, and now want to build that out in this industry. And they have a track record of doing that. Uh, Trinity Hunt has a, a roughly 30-year uh, history of of building, buying and building companies uh, in, in specific spaces, doing it very successfully. And that's what was attracted to us because, yeah, my, my biggest nightmare scenario is that you get an investor, doesn't understand this industry. You know, this industry has peaks and valleys. You have busy years and slow years, storm years, non-storm years, you know, all these different different kind of factors in this business and yeah. having a financial partner that, you know, freaks out when, you know, there's one bad quarter or a bad month or something like that, yeah. you know, comes in and says, hey, you guys need to strip yeah. out X, X headcount, you know, that, that would be very unattractive. Or, or one that just comes in and says, hey, you know, we, we need to enhance uh, EBITDA right now. So we're going to, you know, cut all these areas of investment that you've made in the business uh, yeah. to, to make earnings look as great as we can to get ready for a sale. Yeah, that has zero interest to me as well. And so, you know, with Trinity Hunt, they had a track record of not taking that approach of either trying to just stream, uh, you know, streamline earnings for the short term or just bundling EBITDA, you know, and actually building a great company. Th those were really the big differentiators for us. And, and, and again, the, the culture of the private equity firm, super, super important. And so we spent a lot of time with those guys, getting to know them and understand that they, they really are committed to culture, you know, not just as a, a platitude or, or some sort of nicety that we talk about, but, that's something they really de uh, demonstrated with their other portfolio companies that they built. And so that was really, really critical for us. And you're, you're absolutely right as to how important that should be for any company that's considering a sale.
Well, it goes back to your opening comments is even before you uh, get to know your finances is, you know, kind of define your objectives. And like you said, in your own, those change, right? Those evolve. Absolutely. Uh, you evolve as a person and your company, um, you know, right. based on opportunities and those kinds of things. Yep. I think uh, you you you, uh, you touched on uh, me calling you a sellout. I, I never said that directly, and I never meant to imply it. But yep. that obviously is uh, something. Anybody that attains success, right, is is. Uh, I remember Metall. I, I mentioned Metallica when you said that because yep. you know yep. they, they sold out. They sold yep. out. They're not truly metal anymore, or whatever. And yep. it's like yep. sure they sold out, and it's yep. it's really troubling them, right? right. right. <laughs> so. So we know there's always pressure to grow or die, right? That's just kind of the mantra in business. Um, And so some, the positive, that private equity, we've, and and maybe we've done it to ourselves, right? It's a, we joke about in Tacoma, um, it's a great place to live, but don't let anybody know about it, right? You know, like, it's it's not that great. It's not that great. So we've reported for forever. And, and I cited the CNBC did an article, I think it was back in 2017. We talk about this recession proof business, yep. you know, um, and, and, and the profit margins, everybody thinks, right. If you're a general contractor, you think the mitigation guys are making money. If you're a mitigation contractor, you think the repair guys are making money or the adjusters, everybody thinks it's everybody else. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, with that, with that concept of, of, selling out <laughs> or, or, or fragmentation, I guess is probably the bigger piece. I find it interesting, uh, you know, that uh, fragmentation is a key component of private equity and consolidation. Mm-hmm. RIA's uh, mantra for 2020 was fragmented no more. Right. Is there any overlap there? Um, I guess the one question, I, the honest question I would have is, you know, you're going through this process of, of acquisition, right? Um, was that you in some way trying to forewarn uh, restorers and say, look, like this, this is coming. It's, and it's not coming anymore. It's here, right? And it's no, been here for sure. probably about two years. Right. Um, so on, and I do want to get back to, you talked about more on the, the smaller scale, but on the big scale, um, is there something that that uh, needs to be clearer about that for restorers for the industry? This is in it's not uh, it's not going to turn back. It's not going away. So, what do yeah. people need to know about that on the big scale, on the macro level? Yeah, it's very common in any industry yeah. uh, as this maturation happens. Right, you have a industry that in its early stages there's you know, this really diverse and divergent kind of brand availability to the general consumer. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't matter what, I mean, think of how many things have changed over our lifetime, whether it be in retail, um, you know, how much did the internet just change retail? You know, so there's, there's a lot of different factors aside from consolidation where we just see technology impacting these industries. Great thing about our industry is this. Our industry isn't going anywhere. There's not going to be a robot that comes into a house and you think of all the complexities in any property. No two properties are the same. Yeah. There's not going to be a robot that can come in and diagnose a restoration project, uh, mitigate the loss, and then repair the loss back to a pre-loss condition um, with just pure technology application. Yeah. Yeah. So that's attractive from a macro scale uh, to this private equity world. You think of how many businesses have been totally changed and they're never, ever going to be the same. Our industry will have elements of technology that that help us and enhance the industry, but the industry is not going away. There's too many complexities in this industry, at least probably not in our lifetime. It's not going to go away. Um, And it's going to be, you know, the recession resistance is highly attractive to the private equity world. Uh, and we saw that, especially in COVID, you know, a lot of businesses that were just decimated, Yeah. yeah um, you know, yeah. they will never be the same. I mean, you think of how many of these uh, have, have changed their whole business model has been disrupted. And while restoration companies, I mean, we had an impact from COVID in our company, 
uh, while the shutdown happened. Yeah, it still bounces back. It kind of the business comes right back and rebounds, and that's really attractive uh, to the investors. So there's all of these different things that, um, that that these private equity firms see in this industry that they're going to continue to pursue. So you're absolutely right. Anyone <clears throat> anyone that thinks it's just going to blow over is totally totally yeah. wrong. There's billions and billions of dollars being invested into this industry right now, and everyone has to accept that that's here now. The issue of being a sellout. Um, you know, and I, and I, and we're totally joking around about this, but, you know, when you think about, um, a metal company in that Metallica or whoever would talk about that, you know, they're trying to appeal to a larger, uh, demographic. And so their music fundamentally changes. Right. Yeah. And, and, and then all of a sudden people are like, man, this, this Metallica I'm listening to today is not the the black album from what was that like 1991 or something like that that the black right. album was. earlier yeah ride the lightning like 89 90 yeah okay so yeah so whenever that was right so that that those days are gone yeah um but with with private equity investment i mean some of the good things i mean for my company for example um you know roughly 20 million dollar company at our size our ability to utilize certain pieces of technology are totally impractical yeah. at the size that we are at 20 million. Uh, think of a, a, a truly integrated ERP system, for example. You know, there's a lot of CEOs that lose their jobs over implementation of an, e, an ERP. They're enormous undertakings. They always are over budget. They never meet the time frame that they're originally forecast. We wouldn't be able to think about that. I mean, you need to be a company that's in the hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue to be able to really use those kinds of technology to enhance well, the business. Before, just just for my own, uh, what's an, tell us what an ERP is. An ERP is a fully integrated uh, think of a job management and accounting and CRM and inventory management platform that integrates all of the, the various key indicators for the business to be successful into yeah. one system. Right now, yeah. we cobble it all together. Like in my company, we use Dash for our restoration management, Xactimate for our estimating. We use Sage for our uh, for our, our, our accounting platform, Luxor for our CRM, Outlook for email. I mean, we've got all these different yeah. things all kind of bolted together, right? Yeah. And, and and those are, I think we have like, when we did it, uh, a full inventory of all this, we have like 18 different systems that are all yeah. kind of bound together. Yeah. And ERP is fully integrated, right? It's you're managing the business from one place. Yep. And and th these these sort of systems are are ones that are, you know, in the millions of dollars to be yep. able to implement. They truly enhance the business. I couldn't do that at, at 20 million. At 40 yeah. million, I couldn't do it. At 50 yeah. million, I couldn't do it. Um, but but here with a partner like Trinity Hunt in my case, we're able to to have a plan for the business to grow the business into scale um, and partner with someone who's done that before in other spaces. So Trinity Hunt has other business, like I said, they're very successful in the 30 years and the five different funds they've operated in being able to take these businesses that are, you know, my size companies and then bring the know-how and the technology and the partnerships leverage those into the business to be able to do what I would never be able to do by myself. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where the area of really enhancing the business, so it's almost the opposite, right? Of Metallica. Metallica tried to appeal to a larger base, alienated their existing base. In this scenario, you're able to bring in investment that can truly enhance the business yeah. and make the business better, not, not appeal to more people, but truly enhance the business so that it can better serve its customers and, and its team. So yeah. those are kind of the some of the things that make that attractive um, that, that otherwise, you know, and, and that's I just use the ERP as one example. There's a myriad of examples yeah. that you could use is to talk about what a larger scale operation could do that a small, small organization could not. Yeah, uh, we are running up on the hour. Do you have five, 10 minutes? How much time do you have? What, whatever you need, John, we're good. We're good to go. OK, uh, I don't want to drag it out too much longer. I know you've got plenty of things to do. Uh, I just want to know how many questions I could ask. Um, so 
in that regard, um, uh, so we've already talked about uh, Mark Springer's uh, game plan for success, uh, right? The uh, number one, know your business objectives. Those evolve over time, but uh, be clear on those. Um, and last time you were with us, you talked about internally, you uh, you know, as you're managing multiple offices, you try to meet, I, I can't remember, is it monthly or quarterly at least, right? Yeah, so our leadership team meets quarterly uh, to work on our strategic plan. And, you know, a strategic plan is, it has to change, yeah. right? Like you can't, you can't just say, this is our strategic plan, we're going to use this for the rest of time. That's why you hire really good smart people, way smarter than me. I've got, I'm pretty blessed to have some really, really smart people on our team. And we get together and we assess it. We really start with this, you know, almost kind of like a people would call it like a SWOT analysis. Where are yeah. we today? Like, how has the business gained strength? Where are the areas that we've that we have weakness? Right. Because yeah. all these restoration companies, I know from the outside, sometimes we look at a company and go, man, that company must be perfect. Like you got it all figured out. And I can promise you there's yeah. no company that has it all figured out. Right. We all have our areas of weakness. And usually those change because we start to address a weakness. And sometimes we have an area of strength that ultimately comes a weakness because we focus on one of those weaknesses and you, you improve there and you're not paying attention to another area that you were strong at. And then you've got the areas of what are the trends? In, in the industry, you yeah. know, we see the technology, we see things change uh, in the industry as different uh, uh, trends happen that affect, you know, things that we talked about earlier, like estimating platforms and industry standards. And, you know, even you think, I think about with RIA, you have different ways that RIA has addressed various yeah. challenges that then change how we approach those in our business now. Um, but our team meets quarterly and we're constantly refining the plan. I think if you ever get to the point where you say, this is our plan, we're sticking to this plan forever. Don't care what happens externally. We're going to keep doing this. Then the yeah. business is in a really dangerous place. I know we're deviating just a bit, but I, I'd be interested. How do you know when, um, and, and maybe that's the value of having multiple people in that conversation, but when it's not working now, but we still believe it's right. And we're going to push through, even if it's, you know, on paper, not working or, um, you know, Hey, this seems to be working now, but we need to scrap it or it's failing. This is, we thought this was the way to go, but, uh, we need to scrap it. Like, uh, how has that been important in your process and how have you guys worked through that? Well, I think it's a, that's a good full circle back to you know, the very first Think, kind of question you started with in this in this podcast, and that is knowing your numbers. Yeah. If you uh, have strategy, every strategy has to ultimately affect the numbers. And there's a bunch right. of different numbers, not just net profit, right? There's right. a lot of different uh, key indicators in any business. But if the strategy doesn't ultimately move the needle in those uh, those key indicators, then then you got to go back to uh, revisiting the strategy. Did we have the right strategy? And we either missed it in strategy or we missed it in execution. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, if we, if we didn't execute correctly, then we got to go back and look at our plan for execution and tweak that and adjust that and, and, and throw out what's not working and, and modify this or else our strategy might not have been right uh, to begin with. And I think every business has to find areas of strategy where there's risk. I mean, this is the beauty of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, there are going to be things that we make bets on uh, from a strategy perspective that are great bets. And, yeah. you know, and there are some things over the years, over the 20, 20 plus years I've been running this company that were great bets. I mean, they, they paid off handsomely. But for all of those, there's a bunch of them that didn't work. <laughs> uh, that we thought were great. I mean, we thought this is like, we are really, really onto something. And either we weren't, or we didn't have the right people to execute it, or our, our uh, tactics in the execution were wrong. Uh, yeah. I always know, you know, and I think, you know, that's the key thing is you got to be able to pivot when that's not working. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and ultimately, sometimes those things are a distraction, you know, if they get away from your the core focus of the business, but staying focused on really what is best, especially for us. I know in our time, it evolves, but what's really best for our team? Uh, how can we obsess over the things that really get in the way of our people being successful? Mm -hmm. And when we, when we obsess over those things and we find ways, how do we make it easier for our people's lives and day to day? 
you know, then we probably really hit onto something that's uh, worthwhile and continuing to pursue. Yeah, uh, I think you've heard the episode with Claude Blackburn, who started Dry yeah. Ease. He said he had the 51% rule. As long as I was successful, 51% uh, of my ideas, um, then then we could probably still survive as a business. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, I mean, that's that's true. And I mean, sometimes it may not even be that. I mean, I think sometimes it's just, you know, it's getting the right things right. You could probably have a few yeah. more things, maybe even more than a majority of uh, things that you get get wrong. As yeah. long as you got the right ones right, you know, those are those are the keys. And it always comes down to the people, right? Yeah. If you got yeah. the right people on your team and they're giving you the right intel about what's actually happening out in the real world. Yeah. You know, then then you insulate yourself. It's it's when we get into uh the place that we don't have enough sense of what our people are experiencing, what our customers are experiencing, yeah. that we get that false sense of security and things go sometimes terribly wrong. Yeah. Uh, if we don't focus on the right things. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, um, you know, I'm sure there's different perspectives on that, but I was part of a national company and uh, we were, when I was in Seattle and um, there was a lot of pressure to be like this office or this office, and there's a lot of times, um, you know, where that conversation was like, I really don't care what's going on in that office in that market. You need to understand what's going on in this office in this market. And so right. um, that's uh, learning how to communicate that and advocate for. Mm. I'm sure that's even in in Montana, right? Your office totally. here versus there is. Com you, you mentioned that uh, last time we talked is completely yep. different. So they are They're totally different listen to what's going on in the market and um so let's uh uh definitely mindful of your time and want to wrap up i know ria has been a big part of your career you mentioned at one point you know um even wanting to to maybe step away um mm -hmm. what what has kept you involved why has that been important to you and now that you've sold out are you still going to be involved absolutely involved um you know this industry has given us so much yeah and at this point i think uh, one of the things that i think the most about is the next next generation you know i'm a second generation restorer so yeah well, it's now the third generation or whatever whatever the next folks are i i believe that there's a foundation in place that has been given to me that we've been able to continue to enhance uh, to help make this industry better. And, um, you know, I think that changes for us over the course of our, yeah. of our career. And as long as RIA is focused on the needs of its members, it will be yeah. successful. Um, what will kill any trade association is, you know, internal politics, self-interest. Um, I hope that our board is, going to continue and to stay the course in a laser focus on the needs of our members and that's that's really what drove things like AGA which which have been so successful is that we have to see RIA as an indispensable piece of the business it's not like the only one i think in the past you know, there were certain times where it was focused more on you know people getting together and networking and that's where some of the good old boy sense came from and so forth but when we focus on the needs of the members and what's most important for the industry in that mantra that that you reiterated there with let's let's do what we can to lead this better than we found it then we're, we're on the right track you know there's some people i think that might think how is my resume better when i leave yeah uh, if that's yeah. the motivator you're 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 getting involved for the wrong reason um if you're involved because you say um, there are some issues that we have here in RA will always, I mean, anytime this thing's led by volunteers, it's going to have flaws. Yeah. Um, but to the degree that we can say, Hey, you know what? We are working on behalf of an industry that has tremendous opportunity for us, for our families, for our, our team members, but there's some stuff we got to fix. So let's roll up our sleeves. Let's, let's stay focused on getting these things done for the right reasons. Then yeah. I think it will perpetuate itself and it will continue to be successful. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's how I close the article. There's a great quote from Henry Ford. Uh, mm. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping mm. together is progress and working together is success. 
Mm. So, uh, which, uh, you know, in an industry, our last episode, we were talking to David Olson, who was an area director for Surpro. Mm. And it kind of crystallized more for me and thinking about it in that context, you have independent people, right, who bought into mm. a franchise. Yep. In Surpro or the other franchises, you're not only competing with your competitors in the market, but your own, you know, people in the same um, you know, logo, right? Uh, yep. When they pack the zip codes in, but how do you get a group of independent people to see that being a part of something bigger is better for them and better for the whole? And it, and and he said. Uh, and he worked with more than one of the franchise systems. As long as the franchise system brings value to the restorer, you know, you'll get better buy-in, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes it's just in how you communicate that. So exactly like you said with RAA and, um, yeah. you know, uh, we've had some candid conversations about that in the past, you know, um, but there, there's definitely an upside. Boy, 2020 threw a wrench, right? I mean, there was oh, a man. whole head of <laughs> yeah, getting a uh, getting a trade association through a pandemic is uh, is is quite a quite a challenge. But yeah. you know the the thing that's that's great about man, there are so many volunteers that spend so much time yeah. doing stuff to make it better. And you know, we just released. Um, geez, was it last week? I think it was last week. We released the latest position statement that was on um, standardized price lists. Um, man, so many people pulled together to put information uh, into a concise, organized, defensible position yeah. that we've never had before. And, and this is something that I just, you know, I tell all these volunteers, this is just now a gift to the industry. You've just given a gift yeah. to the industry. And, um, you know, it affects everyone. We're having, I think that we're having discussions in many cases for the first time about the right things right yeah we're talking about the you know the things that a lot of times i think people can complain about and stuff but we're actually talking about how do we fix the how do we solve these problems yeah and that's an exciting conversation to be a part of and and yeah i i, I totally agree with your assessment of that and there's a lot of work left to to happen but there's a lot of good people doing that work and that that yeah. gives me a lot of confidence as we look forward well, and that was, uh, I think it was a Harvard, Harvard Business Review article talking about, you know, some of the things. And that's one of the things, if somebody's going to disrupt an industry, right, um, try to invest to maybe profit from on the short term, what they're looking for is a lack of a core voice, a central voice, right? And so, um, you know, uh, like IICRC and RIA have done, obviously two of the biggest industries or associations um, with the uh, mutual agreement. And so, um, you know, that's, uh, I, I think that was, I'm, I'm still processing all of that, but that would be my encouragement is, you know, we, we need a central voice. I think the biggest piece that's most intriguing about the RIA and probably the hardest to accomplish is the, uh, the lobbying, right? I mean, Every industry we uh, market to has lobbyists. We're, yep. we're so far behind in that yep. regard. Um, and, but it's also, it needs the biggest money and the most <laughs> effort to get to that point. Um, it is. So you guys are laying the foundation, the bricks, um, and those kinds of things. So um, yeah. maybe, I'm, you know, we're, we're lucky. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the legislation that's hitting the, uh, yeah, floor of the Senate in Idaho, um, fortunately, is only one state away from me. Yeah, so we were able to. I was one one of the neat things that's providential about this, John, is that one of the members of the legislature in Idaho is a uh, former restoration contractor, longtime okay. friend of mine. Helped me out back in the early days of my career, in the you know twenty twenty years ago or so. He helped. He took uh, he took an interest in me and invested in me, and and uh, you know this this issue of this assignment of benefit issue hit our radar this week, and and I was able to pick up the phone, call him, get it on his radar. He's in the legislature in Idaho, and uh, and you know I think we've got a really really good chance there of being able to impact that positively for restorers where otherwise we wouldn't have without a, you know, kind of the HE and so forth. 
yeah. you know, that, that could really be a, a catalyst for us to be able to take strides forward in that area of regulatory and legislative yeah. uh, oversight and, and overwatch, because you're right. I mean, I don't, I can't find an industry like ours that has yeah. no representation yeah. uh, from, from that perspective. And it's a big, huge task. Yeah, um, but we've got the foundation now to be able to do that, and um, you know I think that we'll be able to have some some really big pieces, um, you know, by the end of this year that can can really be helpful and useful on that front, and yeah. really give yeah. restore some encouragement that that helps on the way. Yeah, well, awesome, Mark. You've been incredibly generous with your time, um, so thank you. Um, any any other closing thoughts or anything well, that you feel like we didn't touch? But, uh, John, right back at you. Um, you know, I, I uh, enjoy your your podcast and I, I appreciate everything that you're doing uh, to to help enhance and to to build the industry uh, with the uh, the Diojo podcast, your books, everything. I just commend you for what you're doing. Uh, it helps make this industry better. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so right, right back at you. Appreciate all the the stuff that you're doing to make this a better place and help us leave it better than we found it. Well, appreciate it, Mark. And uh, again, uh, thank you. And hopefully, uh, first or what? This is third, third of many, <laughs> third official conversation. So yeah, uh, any anytime I can, I can help out. You just let me know. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, my friend. The assignment of benefits. So we got Ed, the restoration lawyers coming in two weeks, I believe, to talk about that particular topic. So very good. That will be one that, uh, yeah, folks will uh, get some great value out of Ed. Uh, every time he uh, speaks into those sort of issues, there's just uh, so many takeaways for restorers. So yeah, mark your calendars for when Ed's on because he is uh, he is a gift to this industry. Yep. Wealth, a wealth of knowledge. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Appreciate it, John. Talk to you a bit. Yep. Well, there you have it. Um, So again, uh, (laughs) uh, so we have the article in uh, the intentional restore column, restoration and remediation magazine kind of went through um, a, a synopsis of many of the deals. There's a lot of deals uh, I saw just today. There's another one. I think Interstate Restoration made another acquisition. So um, that consolidation piece, private equity is in there. Um, As we open the podcast, I don't have a full conclusion um, on on what that means. But uh, I do. I I think like we talked about, like uh, it's it's not if it's here. So. You need to understand it, need to adapt to it. Um, like Mark brought up, you know, define your business objectives, uh, know your numbers. Um, he's referenced before that book, Scaling Up, um, and uh, and then get to know the trends, SWOT analysis, those kinds of things, meeting with your team and having the tough conversations, you know, knowing when to double down and when to, uh, to scrap an idea um, is all... <laughs> All the fun stuff in business, right? So, um, big, big thank you to Mark and uh, and being generous with his time. I would definitely encourage uh, everybody has their opinions about different things, but uh, please, that was that. That's one conclusion I would say I would like to resonate from the article. If anybody's reading it, is make your own decisions. You know, don't go off of what other people say about something, but do. Do your research. Um, ask people that you respect that are. Uh, there's a big difference between people that talk about change and people that are trying to make change. You know, so um, go where change is happening and try to be a part of it. And so um, I would encourage you to check out RAA. Check out our prior conversation with Mark um, and uh, and Ed, uh, who are big believers in the RIA and. Uh, read the article, you know, so check out the restoration, intentional restorer and re- restoration and remediation magazine with uh, uh, Michelle Blevins and all the good work she does trying to cover the industry. So without further ado, thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Uh, thank you to our sponsor for this week's podcast, I Restore. And our friends at Born to Repair and GMS Podcast, Uh, you can always support the podcast by (laughs) our books on culture and estimating. 
And um, we will see you in two weeks when Ed Cross, the restoration lawyer, joins us to talk about assignment of benefits, which is a heated topic. So if you have any questions or things you want addressed, please reach out uh, through the website, the Diojo. Send your comments and we'll try to get those uh, included in the conversation. Uh... This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard.